Welcome to our third lecture for International Regulatory Frameworks for Climate Change and Environmental Management. So we're moving on from the UN Charter and the International Whaling Convention. We're going to look at the General Agreement, agreement on Tariffs and Trade, so trade law, uh, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the Antarctic Treaty in this lecture. So trade law is this enormous topic. We could spend like an entire course, in fact there are entire courses on just on trade law. So we're only going to look at a few key points. I just want to give you a few of the real fundamentals of trade law and how countries can regulate trade to protect the environment, but there are constraints on what they can do. And so there's uh, quite a lot of, there's been litigation in the World Trade Organization about that. There's a whole range of other treaties other than the general agreement on tariffs and trade. Uh, the original version was signed in 1947 and then there was been big rounds to update it, particularly the 1994 Uruguay round of negotiations which established the World Trade Organization. And there's ongoing developments in trade law, things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the like. I want to mention the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, I haven't dealt with this in previous courses, but there's been some recent litigation in the Netherlands which has brought home the fact that the right to life also includes the right to an environment that doesn't endanger life. And climate change is a threat to that right to life. So even though in the past I've thought of human rights as separate to this course, I want to bring it in just to make you aware of that. And a good place to bring it in is with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. I'll Touch on the Antarctic Treaty in 1959, we sort of jumped 10 years because there was nothing major in terms of environmental regulation uh, through that period, uh, and we'll only briefly touch on the Antarctic Treaty. Okay, but let's start off. Important to keep your sugar levels up. So I've brought along afternoon tea, which are some corn chips. So I'm going to pass them around. If you're not gluten intolerant, then please have a bite. So, yeah, as I said, important to keep our sugar levels up. We've also got some Arnott's biscuits here, uh, a couple of, I think, Anzac biscuits with afternoon tea sort of moving away around the classroom. Let's look at the general agreements on tariffs and trade, 1947, so commonly called GATT. You can find the treaty and the like on the website for it, the WTO website. And I want to particularly look at a case study of palm oil development in Borneo. Uh, as well as logging in Papua New Guinea uh, in thinking about GATT. So obviously trade covers everything, you know, massive amount of issues, but let's just look at palm oil and also illegal logging. So the context we've already covered in the last lecture, so we're in this period of 1945 to 1960. Concern for the environment is relatively low. So GATT is agreed in 1947. It's been updated since then, but we're just using it as a hook to then consider it moving forward at the time it was negotiated, environment was a very low concern. Okay, if we focus in then on the first case study, Borneo and palm oil. So three countries uh, occupy or have sovereignty over Borneo. So we've got Indonesia has got most of it, Malaysia in the northwest, and then Brunei uh, in its own little section. Okay, and Borneo, renowned for its biodiversity, the amazing forests, uh, incredible I once heard an interview with David Attenborough who said what was the most amazing place he'd ever visited in his, his entire career and he said Borneo in the 1960s. So yeah, incredible biodiversity, a global biodiversity hotspot. And yeah, incredible uh, creatures, orangutan, um, this is a proboscis monkey, um, beautiful butterflies, amazing plants and birds and little pygmy elephants. And because of its extensive uh, amount of forests, it's been extensively logged. So this map shows loss uh, until 1900 was very little. It was really around the coastal margins. And then the light green is really this huge amount lost through that century of 1900 to 2000. But then the the sorry, the next green up, forest cover loss from 2000 to 2020, it's gone exponentially in the last few decades, the amount of forest loss from Borneo. And now, yeah, it's been restricted essentially to the more mountainous regions along the spine of Borneo, along the spine of the borders. So a lot of the rainforest destruction in Borneo is for one particular crop, which is palm oil. 
So here's just some of the destruction of the forest. Here, some of the forests that have been cleared. Uh, and in the distance, you can actually see these little sort of flat plantations. They're actually palm oil plantations in the distance. So essentially, forest being cleared to make way for effectively a monoculture of single species of um, palm. And yeah, you can just see what used to be this incredibly biodiverse rainforest uh, simply being turned into a monoculture. So what is palm oil? It's uh, the world's second largest oil crop. It's used extensively in food, baby care, uh, sorry, body care and industrial products. So a lot of soaps, you know, when you wash your hands, a lot of them have got palm oil in them. Uh, a lot of foods have got them in as well. So it's particularly rich in uh, oil and it's used extensively uh, yeah, for a whole range of different products. And Malaysia and Indonesia are the world's largest palm oil producers. And in Australia, we consume about 10 kilograms of palm oil per person every year. So examples of products that contain palm oil or palm oil derivatives are yeah, chips, uh, CCs, and the like. Now, if you look at a packet of chips, so here I've just got salt and vinegar. Um, actually, let's have a look at ours. So we've got uh, CCs. We've got some artists, biscuits, if anyone could. Someone just read the, so the CCs. On the back, there's a list of ingredients that are there. So I'll turn on the lights uh, to give you a bit more to see by. So in the CC, what are listed for ingredients? So corn, vegetable oil, and salt. salt, yep, so they sound exceptionally healthy. <laughs> There's a lot of corn there, sorry, and what? They say may contain milk and salt. May con okay, so, but, so we've got corn, vegetable oil, and salt. Well, few, we haven't eaten any palm oil, that's lucky. And um, in the um, biscuits, what have we got? Uh, sorry, can you just say that one at a time? Wheat flour, and sugar. sugar, yep, again, exceptionally healthy. Vegetable oil, Vegetable oil. Compound, chocolate. compound chocolate, great, sounds yummy. <laughs> Can you see palm oil listed anywhere? There's a whole heap of other things in there like preservatives and the like, but do you see palm oil listed? So that's Arnott Classic Biscuits. Okay, so Hugh. Lucky we haven't eaten any palm oil, otherwise we might be regarded as responsible for the loss of forest cover in Borneo. <laughs> Is anyone going to pick me up on that? We haven't eaten any palm oil? Yeah, yeah, so if you're looking at a packet, and if you read the ingredients like this, potato, so this is a packet of chips, potatoes, vegetable oil, salt, sugar, etc. No listing of palm oil. And that you might assume that it doesn't contain palm oil, but it's all in the words vegetable oil. So vegetable oil covers a whole range of things, including palm. And so palm is commonly disguised um, as yeah, vegetable oil. Some actually, when I went around and for the first time this year, because I went around and chose packets in the supermarket that had exactly that for our class. You might feel like you were trapped now, um, which is kind of true. Um, but uh, I went around and I was looking for packets and it was actually quite hard this year to find. There were quite a lot that actually said no palm or said a particular oil. So they'd actually broken it down to different oils. Uh, so it, it seemed to me pretty clear from having done this same thing for the last 10 years where it used to be you just go and everything just had vegetable oil and now I found it quite hard to find ones that just listed vegetable oil. But, um, yeah, if you read an ingredient, and I'm sure there'll be some of us who actually read the ingredients on the back of packets, um, but, yeah, we know the vast majority of consumers don't read the ingredients and decide not to eat something because it contains a particular product or palm oil or the like. Okay, so major vegetable oils, um, triglycerides, triglyceride, worldwide production by volume in basically a decade ago. Palm was the biggest. Um, soya bean, uh, 
rap seed, um, sunflower seed, peanut, <coughs> cotton seed, palm kernel, coconut, and olive. So, um, yeah, palm kernel is from the seed from the African palm tree, but palm up there, so it's the largest in that year, it was the largest worldwide production of effectively vegetable oils. So, I'm just going to play you a little uh, documentary. Turn off the lights. It runs for about um, five minutes. I've chopped it down from a Dateline presentation, so in some bits of it you'll see edit, four minutes gone. I just got rid of a lot of things that I didn't think were essential. And I, what, what I really want you to notice is he's, he starts in um, looking at palm oil production and then he traces it to Europe uh, and uh, then goes and talks with some producers. So it's from 2010, so things have moved on in Europe. But uh, I really think it's useful to see it from production to essentially consumption and then thinking about that in, in terms of trade. First up, as somebody once asked, is it really progress because a cannibal eats with a knife and fork? Good line, but seriously, why is it that so-called economic industrial progress so often seem to threaten vulnerable creatures in our natural world? There's probably no greater example of this than in Borneo to our north, where Indonesia is making billions from its rapidly expanding palm oil industry. But the deforestation involved comes at a not-so-obvious cost. This report is from Raphael Rowe from the BBC's Panorama Programme. I recall. 
awarded to a former advisor to the Indonesian Ministry of Forestry, now turned environmental lobbyist Willie Smith. So here we are. This is Willie punched our coordinates into the European Space Agency global mapping system. We have these images from the space agencies and they are set uh, radar images, so they penetrate the clouds, you cannot hide anything. And these are the coordinates where you have been into the field. And this area with the white diagonal lines here is a Dr. Palmer group. So Palmer oil developer due to Palmer owns this concession. They supply a number of international traders who sell the oil to Asian and European markets. The area is classified as high conservation value forest. It's virgin forest. Under the Indonesian law, you cannot convert this high quality forest to an oil palm plantation. But as you see, it's still taking place. This is criminal. This should not take place. It means there's no hope left for the most endangered subspecies of the orangutan in West Kalimantan. Let's chop out the good music bit, huh? Palm oil burns Indonesia almost five billion pounds a year, supplying not just the food industry, but supporting the biofuel boom as well. I visited a legitimate plantation to see the palm fruit being harvested.
that palm oil from source. That is, that is, that, 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 it is indeed the intent that by 2015 we should be able to trace that. Should be able to or will be able to. Well, again, again it, the, the question that you're asking is can you segregate that palm oil all the way through on its route to the west? Right now that is not possible. And even though some oil is produced on one plantation which is certified sustainable, the oil will get mixed. And right now it is not possible for us with the volumes we have to segregate that logistics. You can see the difficulty that manufacturers face here in Rotterdam. The palm oil arrives on container ships from all over the world. It's then pumped ashore into giant storage tanks that belong to international palm oil traders. All trace of where the oil comes from disappears in the mix. But a traceable supply of palm oil has been proven possible by companies like Sainsbury's within their own brand products. This is one of your products with, with palm oil in. Yeah. Right on the front of the box. Yeah. Straight over there. Yeah. Made with sustainable palm oil. So it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. We were the first company we think in the world to put a product, a food product, on our shelves which had sustainable palm oil. It took around 10 years to get the first product on the shelf. And we've had to do a tremendous amount of work tracing supply chains all the way back to the farmer and source. Until the industry can properly segregate palm oil right the way back to the plantations, palm oil from illegal sources will continue to find their way into products on your supermarket shelves. Recently, Unilever terminated a large contract with a supplier called Sinar Mass because of reports it was destroying high conservation value forests. Unilever has since told Panorama it intends to try and overcome the supply system problems so that no due to palm oil ends up in its products. Some of the UK's biggest manufacturers and retailers are trying to do the right thing, but their efforts are unlikely to slow the pace of deforestation. And the reality is, only 3% of the world's palm oil is currently certified as sustainable. And continues to be the greatest threat to the orangutan. The bit that really strikes me in that clip is when he gets to Rotterdam and you see all those ships there with the massive volumes and then you start to think about the the actual problem of trying to regulate where all of that is coming from and then if it's you know you have to segregate it out and once it's mixed any trace of where it's come from is gone. So uh, illegal producers can essentially just infiltrate the legal supply chain. It's really difficult to regulate because of the scale of, you know, the volume of material that you're talking about and how far it travels across the world. So uh, if you followed that, because I've been following the story for a decade, sometimes you see positive news. So this was a story in 2014 about essentially steps being taken to multinational corporations to um, uh, rein in illegal uh, clearing. And then you, at the same time, you'll see you know, negative stories about corruption. Um, this is from 2014 as well, world's worst illegal logging in Indonesia. Um, also, uh, routinely or annually, we see news stories about incredible uh, air pollution that's caused in Southeast Asia, in, in Malaysia um, and in uh, other countries due to essentially the massive clearing of forests and then broad scale burning off. So Indonesian fires um, yeah, and peatland fires causing huge levels of pollution. Here's a picture showing um, South um, Sumatra. And yeah, you can just see the smoke pouring across to Singapore and Malaysia. So huge problems in those countries, the air pollution that's caused. And here's all the burns going on. So enormous scale. 
and very, very difficult to rein in. So yeah, that's just another image of 2015 and fires across um, Borneo and um, other parts of Indonesia, so active fires. So causing huge pollution on a regional scale. So that's one problem and I'm going to come back and we're going to look at GATT in that context, but I also just wanted to um, perch on a different problem uh, which I'm involved in at the moment in Papua New Guinea, so illegal logging. So palm oil, you know, you clear the forest and then you plant um, palm oil, so it's about regulating the product uh, of palm oil, but for logging then obviously you're regulating the timber um, extracted. So this is a picture of taken last year when I was up uh, in Papua New Guinea with um, my solicitor there on a phone and a, and a couple of others from the solicitor's firm and our boat driver uh, there in the blue. So we were in New Hanover, which is in the northeast of Papua New Guinea. So there's an archipelago of islands that, that curl around from the PNG mainland and go up through New Ireland, uh, sorry, New Britain and and um, New Ireland. So New Hanover is an island in that region. And just for context. Uh, in Papua New Guinea there's been widespread corruption and one of the systems that's been used for illegal logging has been this system called uh, SABLs or Special Agricultural and Business Leases and they've been widely rorted for two decades and in 2011, 12, 13 there were some commissions of inquiries into them and they've found widespread rampant abuses of the system and for the island that I'm looking at it was one of them and it found that essentially that the lease that had been granted was um, basically done fraudulently. Uh, it recommended that the lease be removed and the basic, th the basic way that uh, the loggers operate is to go into an area, bribe a few local strongmen and then essentially get their consent, pay them some money don't get actual consent from the customary landholders. So in this area that I'm looking at, there's something like 10,000 people who have an interest in the customary land there. And to authorise the logging, that's 10,000 people spread across uh, 11 tribes or 11 clans. To authorise the logging under customary law, they should have called a huge meeting and gotten effectively a majority vote. So effectively you'd have to inform 10,000 people, we intend to log your land and then get over 5,000 people voting in favour. Okay, so that's an enormous undertaking in an area with, um, you know, limited um, communications where effectively you've got to walk from village to village. They didn't do anything like that. They effectively got eight people um, who they paid a little bit of money to, about 100 kina, about $20, uh, and those people signed consent forms that then were used to get these leases. So instead of going out and getting consent from 10,000, they got the leases um, through effectively bribing some local people. And then the leases were granted under the PNG system. So on paper it looks lawful, but in reality there's not been proper consent. And then the people, and then they come in with police as well. So the um, loggers effectively hire the local police to effectively go in as their bodyguards. So if anyone wanted to object to the logging, loggers coming onto the land, you get locked up. So um, effectively the logging then just moves through the area with this, the tacit support of the government and the police and no proper consent. But on paper, um, the loggers can look, you know, point to a forestry approval um, and a special agriculture and business lease and say what we're doing is lawful. Uh, the reality is very different. So um, despite the commissions of inquiries um, having damning findings in 2013, effectively the government has um, allowed them to continue. So since 2013 there's been massive clearing. So this is after the commission of inquiry recommended to be revoked. Massive clearing. So the island that you're looking at there, you can see the bar down the bottom, it's 20 kilometres across. So all of that purple, so the SABL that we're looking at is portion 887C, this massive area of New Hanover, and all of that pink purple area is what's been logged um, since 2012. So, and here's just focusing in um, on some of the logged areas, and particularly see this um, little village here, Metamin. So um, I was really shocked because this picture was taken in 
2015, and you can see the pollution um, in the at the mouth of the river in this 2015 image. I went there at the end of last year, so 2018. I thought that there would be considerable recovery, but I'll show you some pictures there. So this is an article from Global Witness talking about destroying the Min River, and that's that Metamin, and you can see the erosion. Um, yeah. So essentially gone from that image on the left to you know, massively logged. So that's Metamin, and you can see the pollution in the river. Then this, I took this picture going into Metamin, and the villagers said the river used to be clear and they used to drink from it. Uh, can't do that anymore. It's effectively cloudy. Uh, you can't drink it. And this is three years after the loggers. So effectively, they just caused massive erosion in the river system where they used to fish and drink from. They can't do that anymore. So here's Metamin going ashore. And that's the river. So it used to be clear and um, you could fish in it. Now just this you know, turgid brown mass. Um, the loggers, so that people complained about the loss of their drinking water. So the loggers gave them, see that blue container there? Um, so the loggers came and gave them these water tanks, um, but they aren't actually water tanks. They were obviously the cheapest big container that the loggers could get because in fact they were actually sewage tanks, new ones, but they didn't have any proper mosquito covers or anything, so they just become these big mosquito breeding um, centres, not plumbed in or anything. So, and then this is so here's Metamin, and here's the area that's logged. Um, so the next image is looking across that, just yeah, completely um, cleared. This is yeah one of the logging tracks and a creek, so massive erosion. This is where they put the logs onto the ship, so just cleared over the coral reef. Um, yeah, and this is just in you know the last few years. It's not like this is we're looking at pictures from the 60s. Um, when we um, went over to the island, um, the logging ship was actually just anchored off Kaviang um, with you know, a huge amount of logs and a lot of anger in the communities about essentially their livelihoods being taken and the damage that's been done. Okay, there's a whole heap of reports about you know what happens to that. So this is a report from Global Witness from 2017, basically tracing how the timber from PNG, a lot of it goes to China. Uh, and then ends up in things like flooring, produ flooring products in the US. So essentially it's a global trade. Uh, now the loggers would say what we're doing is lawful because you've got all of the relevant approvals in the country of origin. The reality is different. So can a country like Australia or any other country try to protect forests in Borneo and PNG regulating imports of palm oil or timber? That's the question I want us to ask. And can think about it from different perspectives, okay? So um, what do you think Malaysia and Indonesia, if we're thinking about palm oil, what do you think their attitude is going to be if Australia wants to regulate palm oil imports? Let's just say we want to ban palm oil coming from, uh, from Borneo. What do you think Indonesia and Borneo is going to say about that? Are they going to be happy? No, they're going to be very unhappy. They'll say things like what? You're interfering in our internal affairs. These are domestic matters. You know we have our laws. These are these um, products have been produced in accordance with our laws. So Malaysia and Indonesia are unhappy. Similarly, um, logging from Papua New Guinea. If you're going to regulate logging that's coming out of those areas, and Australia wants to ban, say, illegally logged timber, is PNG going to be happy about that? If it, how about if it goes to China and now we want to regulate the imports of what we say is illegal timber from China? And then you face the whole issue of, well, how do you source it as well? Like once it's gone to China and been turned into flooring products, how do you source the current country of origin and how do you distinguish the legally, um, legally produced timber from the illegally produced timber? Particularly when, if you look at the country of origin, the, there's a paper trail there saying it's actually lawful what they're doing and it's not until you actually dig deeper that you can actually see that all of this is happening um, unsustainably in breach of um, the landholders' consent. Um, there's all these problems. Can you see just this whole nest of complexity and difficulty? 
What about um, for palm oil? What about the Netherlands? So Rotterdam, where the palm oil moved through, what's their interest then in regulating, say, palm oil production? So they're the port state. That's where all of the, you know, a lot of the palm oil, it's, it's, it's you know, got massive ports. It's all coming ashore there. You know, they've got an interest in... Um, in it, but there's a financial interest in you know them being, remaining a global centre for trade. Um, China, obviously, is a huge manufacturer, but sourcing a lot of these materials, it doesn't want regulation of um, trade generally because it wants to be able to sell its products. So any restraints on trade can be seen by a massive manufacturer like China as a threat to its economy. Australia and the US, you know, we're the consumers. Um, we're not actually suffering the damage directly. Um, we're just consuming the products. So we've got a different perspective to each of those countries. So there's many different international perspectives in a problem like this. And I would also recognise that you know, Australia's... We're importing timber um, and the like, but you know, we cleared all of our lowland forests um, decades ago. So this is where I'm from in North Queensland the Tully floodplain or a bit north of where I'm from. But basically all of the lowland forests have been cleared and, you know, this is really common when I grew up, just sugarcane everywhere. No creeks, just drains that have been turned into, you know, creeks were all turned into drains for sugarcane um, with, you know, significant pollution problems. But all of the rich biodiverse forests, all gone to make way for a monoculture. And, yeah, so if you look at a satellite image here of... That's the Tully floodplain. And the pink area is all of the sugarcane farming. And all of the green is forest. But the only green bits left um, are generally the mountains. So all of the floodplain we cleared. And similarly down around Ingham, all the floodplain gone. So, um, you know, for Australia or the US to say to Indonesia, you know, you shouldn't clear your lowland forest. Uh, Indonesia can turn around and say, hey, well, you did that, you've already done that. You don't stop us from developing. Um, so the, yeah, there's many species that have been severely affected by extensive past clearing in Queensland, such as uh, cassowary. Yep, so uh, I'm not just wanting to point the finger at Indonesia and, and say they're doing something wrong when we've also done a lot of damage. But if we think about it now, and how, if, if the Australian government wanted to regulate palm oil importation or timber um, importation from um, PNG, can it do it? Let's unpack the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Okay, so GATT, signed in 1947. It's basically about free trade, unrestricted trade. So it's about trying to stop countries imposing barriers to unrestricted trade. So a lot of the, I'm not going to, they, they sound really technical, but basically it's all about um, don't impose barriers to trade. So Article 3, the contracting parties recognise that internal taxes and other internal charges and laws, regulations, requirements affecting internal sale, etc., cetera, um, should not be applied to imported or domestic products so as to afford protection to domestic production. So the classic way you could do it is you could say, well, um, you know, um, sugar, let's just say in Australia, you can say sugar produced uh, in Australia will be free of taxes and any sugar that's imported from overseas uh, has to pay $100 a kilogram. So that effectively you make any imported sugar prohibitively expensive compared to domestically produced sugar. And so effectively you're, while you allow imported sugar, you tax it to such an extent that it becomes prohibitively expensive um, without any real um, reasonable explanation for why you treat domestic and overseas production differently. So a whole heap of stuff in GATT about free trade and there's many different ways that you can restrict trade or put obstacles in it. You can tax it, you can put um, restrictions or you know, other things on it. The article that I want us to focus on and for you to be aware of, and the, there's always a question about trade on the exam at the end, and it's about Article 20. So there'll definitely be a question about this. Article 20 says, subject to the requirements, so most of GATT is about unrestricted trade, 
But then Article 20 allows countries to restrict trade for certain purposes. So subject to the requirement that such measure, measures are not applied in a manner that would constitute a means of arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination between countries where the same conditions prevail or a disguised restriction on international trade, nothing in this agreement shall be construed to prevent the adoption or enforcement of any contracting party of a measures A, necessary to protect public morals. So um, uh, let's just say you are in Saudi Arabia where they um, don't allow alcohol. Um, you might prohibit alcohol being imported into your country because you say, uh, you know, our religion, our culture does not allow alcohol. So, uh, and they would have a, an argument um, based on uh, Article 20A that it's necessary to protect public morals. Um, obviously, you know, there's a whole heap of uh, horrible material that's produced that, you know, you might um, restrict because, um, uh, you know, it's horrible content um, dealing with children or something like that. So you might ban that sort of material. And that's a restriction on trade, but it's lawful uh, under GATT because effectively um, it comes within one, within one of those exceptions. Then um, B and G deal with things that you can link to environment. So necessary to protect human, animal or plant life or health or relating to the conservation of exhaustible natural resources. So this is written into a treaty that's agreed in 1947, but allowing and recognising you to restrict trade for environmental purposes. Now, in Article 20, that first paragraph is called the chapeau, um, C-H-A-P-T-E-A-U. It's a French word. It means, does anyone speak French? Chapeau? It means in French, the hat. Um, and it's a term that's used in, because a lot of treaties used to be written in French. Some, I mean, obviously, French is still a UN language, so treaties still are written in French. But um, chapeau is um, used to refer to effectively the introductory paragraph to the treaty. Sorry, to an article like that. So in the chapeau, um, there is limitations on, you can't simply do any restriction on trade to protect the environment. It has to come within the restrictions of the chapeau. So it has to be not arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination. So in um, GATT, there's a whole range of other measures as well. So anti-dumping um, has been important in some of the recent US-China disputes about dumping of things like solar panels. So where a country might produce and subsidize a product that then it supplies in another country at cheaper than it actually what it costs to produce. So that effectively it destroys the competition in another country by dumping products. So there's a whole range of things that countries can do to manipulate trade. And so GATT was trying to basically set up measures to restrict those things and allow for unrestricted trade. Okay, so thinking about how we interpret a treaty, we talked about principles before, um, about interpreting them in good faith in accordance with their ordinary meaning. But there's also a, um, a fourth step that is relevant, particularly around trade law, which is that decisions of international courts and tribunals um, may be relevant for interpreting treaties. It's relatively rare, but particularly for trade and the World Trade Organization appellate body, that's been particularly um, important for the understanding of what these treaties mean. So in relation to Article 20, there's been a series of famous cases about, um, often against the US. So the US tuna dolphin case in 1991 was a case where the US had restrictions, uh, and the turtle case as well. The turtle one is an easy one to explain, um, 1998. So this was a claim by a range of countries against the US. The US had, had imposed restrictions on selling shrimp, so what Australians call prawns, so you know the little crustaceans that you know are good to eat. Um, uh, so the US had imposed restrictions on the sale of shrimp um, within the US that, they ha that producers um, of shrimp had to show that they were caught 
with nets that had turtle excluder devices. Essentially, when you're dragging along a net um, for prawn on the bottom of the seafloor, um, if a turtle gets caught in it, uh, it can drown because it can't get back to the surface. So what nets in the last 20 years, or what a lot of fishing nets have done is they put a, um, a, a board, a series of grills in the, in the net with a little flap so that if um, prawns just pass through the gr <laughs> grills, but a, something like um, a turtle hits the grills and gets basically pushed out of the flap so that a turtle doesn't get caught in the end of the net. So the, the US law required these turtle excluder devices to be used, and there was a claim brought against it which was successful um, from a number of Southeast Asian countries, um, basically arguing that the ban was arbitrary um, in many ways um, but particularly because they didn't take into account or didn't allow for the differences in turtles between the turtle excluder devices um, in the regulations were aimed at basically turtles in the Gulf of Mexico and around the coastline of the US and Vietnam and Southeast Asian countries argued that we've got different turtles and your regulations don't take that into account therefore they're arbitrary and they won so the US has you know, lost the US tuna dolphin case, lost the US shrimp turtle case. It crops up a lot. Why do you think countries sue the US over trade laws? Market. Such a massive market. Whereas Australia, you know, who cares? We're such a small market, whatever our restrictions are. Um, whereas the US gets litigated against because it's such a massive market that countries want to be, have access to it. So um, the key principles to emerge from that is that trade measures can be employed to meet environmental objectives so long as they're not arbitrary or discriminatory. And a key point that I want to emphasise is that measures to implement cooperative international efforts such as the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species uh, are more likely to satisfy Article 20 of GATT than unilateral non-consensual measures. So we'll talk about CITES later, but it's about trade in endangered species. So things like ivory. So Australia bans the import and sale of ivory uh, and we can do that basically because we're implementing CITES, um, but we would have great trouble banning, say, something like palm oil um, because essentially it's not protected under CITES or under any other massive um, international regime. So, yes, you got a question? Yes, yeah, so a great question, uh, and um, I should throw you a banana for that. <laughs> so it's always a bit exciting when something goes flying across the classroom. Um, okay, so where are patents in all of this? Um, so there's a whole heap of work on patents and intellectual property over particularly genetics, uh, and things like the Arche, um, agreement under the Biodiversity Convention and the like, there's, um, yeah, there's a, trade law is a really complicated um, area. We'll sk we're skimming the surface here. The main thing that I really want to emphasise to you is you can restrict trade, but the two key things, um, or the two big red flags is you shouldn't be arbitrary and you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't discriminate between domestic production and overseas production. As soon as you see two sets of rules for domestic and international, particularly when the international production is harder, then that's putting up a big red flag that that's discriminatory and will breach the WTO rules. Yep, you got a question? breach those rules, what are the consequences? Great. Again, great, great question. Uh, what are the consequences? Um, the WTO system is fairly robust in terms of enforcement. Um, so, um, the you know, so there have been some big disputes between the US and China, um, the China and Canada, uh, and essentially it's basically pushing the countries to change. Uh, it also allows, if the country won't change, then it allows for countervailing measures. So you might like. Um, you know, the US basically, I think it's, what was it, aluminium? 
um, produced from China and then putting import taxes on it. So if the country is, if the other country is found to be in breach, then if they refuse to change, then the system allows you to put in measures to punish them. So, okay, so I don't want to stress you about trade. I just want you to be, I really want to bring home that this is such an important topic. It's really complicated and really complex when you get down to the detail, but the, the basics are um, that you can restrict trade to protect the environment. When you're doing that, you shouldn't be arbitrary or discriminatory. So arbitrary just means that you, um, you don't really, you haven't um, set up rules that are flexible and allow the differences in sources of products to be taken into account. So um, you need to have flexibility and, rec you know, it can't just be an arbitrary blanket, you know, we're not going to accept any palm oil from, from Borneo. Um, that's going to, you know, f crash and burn in terms of arbitrary restrictions. If Australia wanted to impose that sort of restriction, it would be really problematic. As opposed to something like food labelling laws. Um, sorry, you've got a question? I haven't, I had a great question. I haven't looked at the US ban on shark fins. Um, I presume it's um, more detailed when you actually look at their restrictions. They're very attuned now to basically trying to deal with the issues that, were, that arose in things like the um, shrimp tuna case and the shrimp turtle case and those sorts of things. So I would expect that when you looked at the US laws, they would be framed around trying to address the GATT requirements, and it becomes really technical and really quickly. For our, for our purposes, it's just a broad understanding you can restrict trade for the environment, but you can't be arbitrary or discriminate between domestic and overseas producers. Um, and the, ch the, cha the principles to be applied have changed over time, so um, it's b the point's been made that um, there's some, there have been somewhat illogical interpretations. And in fact, the US restrictions in the tuna dolphin case would now pass with flying colours. So the interpretation of the provisions have changed over time. I don't want to get caught in the complexity. I just want to basically um, us to be aware of the, the broad brush issues. So I won't get bogged down in that. So there's ongoing disputes, yeah, UN, EU and China over solar panels um, and the like. So GATT was signed in 1947. Uh, then um, a, a, there's been a, a series of rounds of negotiations for new trade laws. Um, the most important was the 1994 uh, Uruguay round of negotiations, or 1986 to 1994. They were concluded in 1994, uh, the Marrakesh um, agreements, where there are about 60 agreements and about 550 pages um, GATT is basically incorporated as part of those and it established the World Trade Organization and the framework around it. And there's a whole range of um, treaties um, built into that. So the agreement on technical barriers to trade, TRIPS. Um, uh, I don't want to get into the detail. Um, in terms of domestic action in a country like Australia, there have been pushes for labelling. Um, so in 2011, the Greens put forward a change to the Food Standards um, Act at a federal level, and it wasn't supported by the Gillard government and uh, the Xenophon, um, the Greens and the coalition. It stalled in the House of Representatives because the government didn't... So essentially they wanted palm oil to be labelled, and the government refused because of industry lobbying. The EU has had specific labelling of palm oil since December 2014. Um, I'm not going to play this clip, but you know this is just a clip from last year saying sustainable palm oil may not be so sustainable. Really, really difficult to actually police any of these regimes, and you know something might claim to have been sustainably produced. Actually, working out whether that's actually the case or not is really difficult. Often. Um, okay, you can take personal action. 
um, choose products that um, say they don't contain palm oil, at least that's a step. Uh, it's re relatively easy. Um, I know with margarines, what my family is doing now is we just change totally to butter because it's very difficult to find any margarines that don't just say vegetable oils. If you want to choose something that says no palm oil, then often you won't even be able to buy that in smaller shops. So we just changed over to butter so that at least it's, um, yeah, no palm oil. Uh, and yeah, you can support conservation groups working on the problem. But you know, our choices in choosing not to buy things in a shop or, or not, it has some effect, but it's a really weak level of regulation from a country like Australia. Um, just wanted to give an example of Australian um, domestic laws trying to deal with illegal logging and relate this to the PNG problem. So Australia's got this Illegal Logging Prohibition Act and um, it prohibits the importation of illegally logged timber and timber products such as paper and the processing of illegally logged Australian raw logs. What do you say about those first dot points in terms of applying GATT, um, the principles in GATT? What's the thing, without knowing anything more, what jumps out at you, the fact that this law, it restricts overseas or importation of illegally logged timber, but it also restricts domestically produced illegally, illegal timber. What's good about that from a GATT perspective? It's not discriminatory. It's not discriminatory. The fact that there are two, like if it only prohibited the import of illegally logged timber, then you would see, well, that's problematic from a discrimination perspective. Actually dealing with the issue of not being arbitrary, though, is really, really hard. And so what this act does is really quite smart, I think. It flips it around and requires that importers and domestic producers have a system of due diligence that they have to basically be able to verify where the logs have come from. So it puts the onus on them to show that the logs have come from, leg from legal production. So rather than saying you can't have timber from Borneo or you can't have timber from PNG, it says you can't import timber that's illegally logged and um, you've got exemptions from that if you've got in place a system of, for due diligence where you track where the timber comes from and you can establish a paper trail where you can satisfy the Australian regulators that your timber uh, has come from legal sources. So can you see how that, it's quite small this law, but effectively it's just putting the duty on the importers or the domestic producers. And there's country specific guidelines. So there's a definition about illegally logged in relation to timber means harvested in contravention of laws in force in the place, whether or not in Australia where the timber was harvested. And I just want you to think about the example I gave you of PNG. Okay, so, that logging in New Hanover, they actually have their uh, lease and their forestry permits. They've got all their permits under national laws. Actually working out though that what they're doing is, so the court case I'm involved in is basically looking to set aside all of those permits because we say they weren't given with proper consent, they're a breach of the PNG constitution, they should be set aside because they were not lawfully granted. But until the customary landholders achieve that and have those things set aside, then an importer of those logs could basically look at the forestry permits and say, well, it's lawful, and therefore we've satisfied due diligence. So even a due diligence system doesn't actually, can still end up with illegally produced timber, because um, it can be really hard to work out from the country of origin whether it's legal or illegal. Um, so yeah, due diligence requirements require them that's, you know, basically you've got to audit, you've got to satisfy. In PNG there's an um, international monitor system, so they'll go along and they put a little barcode on the, ev on the end of every log, they put a barcode and essentially it should be able to be scanned from where it's cut down onto the ship all the way to China essentially, so there's a barcode system following every log of what species it is, where it's come from, who cut it down. Uh, and so there's this verification system that's in place. And uh, that seems to work pretty well, mainly because the, the PNG government uses it to then calculate royalties 
I don't think the PNG government is actually that interested in the legality of the timber. It's more that they use that system to then calculate royalties. Um, okay, so due diligence is used in this system. Uh, and in terms of an example of country-specific guidelines, under that Australian system, there is one for PNG. And basically it says if you've got a timber permit and timber licence under the Forestry Act, then it's lawful. So for New Hanover, they have those things. So logs produced from the area that I'm working on would get through the Australian system. If you actually go and look at it on the ground, it's not lawful, but it's got all the paperwork. And that's a huge problem because a lot of the countries that we're looking at, you know, corruption and maladministration are systemic. Like in Papua New Guinea, it's horrible to go there. And, you know, they've got all of these resources, there's all of these great people, and the government is just, um, yeah, allowing rampant, unsustainable development to go on everywhere. Okay, so this framework complies with GATT and the WTO, but it falls down where permits are issued under domestic law that are a product of corruption or poor governance. Um, I'm going to completely leave foreign investment, um, so banks and the like. Uh, trims, the Agreement on Trade-Related Investment Measures. Uh, again, countries have different perspectives on those things. So if, you know, if a country like, say, Australia, if we've got a, a, a mining company that's based in Australia, should we regulate their activities when they go to Indonesia? Similarly, the UK. Should it regulate you know, UK companies when they go and work in Nigeria or anywhere else in the world? Should we impose requirements on our companies that are working around the world in their investment, in their operations, that they have to comply with human rights and environmental standards? It's really hard. Okay, I want to skip over Trans-Pacific Partnership, but it's a recent example of a new trade measure. Um, one of the big things that's problematic in trade laws at the moment are these things called investor state dispute settlement mechanisms. Essentially what it allows is investor co corporations to sue countries that um, impose regulations that affect their investments and they allow them to sue not in the court system of the country involved but effectively in these sort of dark courts of arbitration with people that are appointed that might not be full-time judges um, there's a huge sort of cesspit of um, problems around um, this, but it's been really pushed by the US particularly uh, and the corporations um, that are basically pushing for these things to be um, built into trade laws because it allows companies to, to then sue governments for damage to their investments uh, and it can be a real restraint on countries then trying to do things in a more sustainable way. So. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was basically, it was about a US-led idea to counter China's influence in the Pacific. Uh, and then when the um, President Trump was elected, he saw it as this um, terrible deal that he withdrew the US from it. Um, and it, it went forward even without the US. Um, so last well, November 2017, countries other than the US, so Canada and the like, and a whole range of countries in Southeast Asia, um, agreed to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, it's not a lot of things that are called free trade. They aren't really free trade. They're really about preferential trade agreements, so about allowing reduction in taxes between specific countries. So many governments like them because they give um, something to basically crow about but they don't actually achieve a lot um, in terms of um, improving trade. Can I just summarise GATT and other trade agreements? So GATT promotes free trade and limits the ability of states to impose trade restrictions. A trade measure can be employed to meet environmental objectives so long as it's not arbitrary or discriminatory um, and measures to implement cooperative international efforts such as societies are more likely to satisfy those requirements. And yeah, the decisions of international courts and tribunals might be relevant for inter interpreting treaties. Those are the key points I want you to take away about GATT. Um, I want to take a break and um, uh, let's take, say, five minutes. We'll come back and how about we just go until half past? Let's get up, take a break. We'll come back and we'll talk about human rights and briefly about Antarctica. 
um, for probably about the next half an hour before we go on to our workshop. Cool? So let's come back and finish off this lecture. So before, the, before we had a break, we were talking about uh, trade and don't want to scare you with trade. really want to keep it at a su superficial level. It is a very complicated topic. Just those few key things that I want you to remember about it. Let's just move on to human rights and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. As I said at the beginning of this lecture, I haven't included it in previous years, but a recent important decision in the Netherlands by a court has emphasised that the right to life includes the right to an environment that doesn't endanger life, and that has significant implications for climate change. Uh, so the Universal Declaration of Human Rights I thought was a good hook to bring in human rights, so signed in 1948, so obviously in the aftermath of World War II where there'd been not only countries killing each other's uh, armies and so many people killed in that way, but also the genocide uh, of, that occurred in Germany and the extermination of um, ethnic minorities and religious minorities such as the Jewish people. So that terrible tragedy in the Holocaust in Germany then led to uh, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights in 1948. So it's a milestone document uh, written in the aftermath of World War II, drafted by representatives with different legal and cultural backgrounds from all regions of the world. Uh, it was proclaimed by the United Nations General Assembly in Paris. So this is a General Assembly resolution. So again, it's non-binding. Uh, but it has tremendous persuasive force. And it was intended as a common standard for the achievement of all peoples and all nations. It's, so it's not a treaty. Uh, and it's set for the first time fundamental human rights to be universally protected and it's been translated in over 500 languages. So there's no express right to a healthy environment in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but one of its core rights is the right to life, and that's in Article 3. So. Article 3, everyone has the right to life, liberty and security of person. And it's been followed by 18 major human rights conventions, including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in 1966. And yeah, it's again heavily influenced by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, entered into force in 1976, there's a Human Rights Commission, 173 parties, so very widely adopted doesn't include China, which is a signatory only, so China hasn't ratified it. So you can see there the um, state parties to the ICCPR, and yep, so widely adopted globally. So like the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the ICCPR contains no express right to a healthy environment, but again, Article 6 provides a right to life, and There's current litigation against Australia based on uh, that convention. So there's a uh, action that's been brought um, before the UN Human Rights uh, Committee by Torres Strait Islanders. It was launched earlier this year. It's called Our Islands, Our Home. Uh, and they're arguing that Australia's inaction on climate change and coal exports are damaging their human rights be interesting to see what is the result of that case. But in the last few years, there's been some really famous litigation in the Netherlands. And prior to this case, I never looked at any Dutch um, court cases at all. Um, but this case has been groundbreaking globally because it's the first uh, court case in which a government has been held to be accountable for its poor action or its inaction or insufficient action in addressing climate change. So this case um, has gone through two levels and is currently um, awaiting a final decision in the top appellate court in the Netherlands.
but there was a district court decision in 2015 which held that the, state, the Netherlands was in breach of um, the Dutch Civil Code. That was then appealed by the state to the Court of Appeal and they dismissed the appeal but on a different basis. They based their decision on a breach of the EU Human Rights um, Convention and the state has appealed that and um, waiting for a decision in that. So here's some of the people outside the court waiting for the Supreme Court um, he oral hearings earlier this year. And just for context, the European Convention on Human Rights uh, signed in 1950, so again in the aftermath of World War II and the Holocaust and all of the terrible things that had happened, and Article 2 gave all people a human right to life. So everyone's right to life shall be protected by law. No one shall be deprived of his life, intentionally save in the execution of a sentence of a court, etc. So a right to life. Um, and absolutely fundamental, but no mention of environment. And what the court, the Court of Appeal said in the, um, its decision is that the interest protected by Article 2 is the right to life, which includes environment-related situations that affect or threaten to affect the right to life. So I phrase that as the right to life includes a right to an environment that won't endanger life. So not a right to a healthy environment generally, but if you've got an environment that is going to endanger life, so if there's, say, mass destruction, so we're going to argue in this PNG case that there's a breach of, there's a PNG constitution protection of the right to life, and we're going to argue that the clear felling of these, the forests has endangered the village's right to life in that it's damaged their ability to produce food and, you know, f safe drinking water, those sorts of things. Yep? Um, especially, like, with stuff that's going on in Australia right now with, like, fires and extreme weather conditions, how do you argue, or would you argue, that those, you know, are a result of the climate change or whatever? Could you argue that in court reasonably that that's against the right to life? Or is that too hard because it's natural weather? Great. Great question. In fact, I'm going to go two frogs for that. So, um, yes, you can argue those things, and that's exactly what the um, Our Islands, Our Home case is about, arguing that you know, what Australia is doing is, is a breach of their human rights. So those sorts of arguments. Um, they're relatively novel. I mean, the Dutch case is only a couple of years old, and it's really, like, for me, like, I've looked at environmental law for you know, for the last 30 years, and it was a revelation to think, yeah, the right to life. Like, why doesn't it include a right to an environment that doesn't endanger life? Like, it's actually a really, to me, novel. Some people would say, oh, we've been thinking about this for 20 years. But to me, it's a really novel step forward. Uh, Australia doesn't have a constitutional protection for the right to life. Um, I'm going to mention that in Queensland, um, uh, so Eugenda was the, what the court case was called. The Eugenda Foundation was the Dutch conservation group that bought the case. It's been influential already. Um, earlier this year there was a court, of, court decision in New South Wales by Chief Judge Preston refusing a coal mine in part on the, on the contribution that the coal would make to climate change. Really controversial. <laughs> controversial, I think that absolutely the right decision, but controversial at political level and the state governments looking to overturn that decision through legislation at the moment. In Queensland, we are about to have a Human Rights Act come into force. It's, it's intended to enshrine the ICCPR. It commences on the 1st of January. We haven't previously had human rights protected in Queensland. Uh, and the main objects are yeah, to promote human rights and the like. There's 23 rights protected under the Act. There's no right to a healthy environment, but in Section 16, there's a right to life. So uh, the right to essentially in, in climate litigation um, that certainly I'm working on about coal mines, there's a big new coal mine coming in the Galilee Basin that Clive Palmer's proposing China first. The right to life and you know how the coal mine impacts on that are the sorts of things that we're going to argue. So the law is changing 
and evolving and yeah that's the main thing I wanted to emphasize you know in terms of um, human rights uh, in the past I think most people would have thought didn't extend to a, essentially environmental issues but we're seeing that change just in the last few years and, and I think it will be now widely ad widely accepted that climate change threatens the right to life which is probably the most universal human right protected in multiple constitutions and um, bills of rights around the world including the US, the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution includes a right to life. So um, yeah, really interesting development I think. And I don't want to dwell on that because um, I know there's um, too much information already um, but I just wanted to emphasise, whoops, I just really want to emphasise that um, the law is evolving, that now human rights uh, issues are seen as extending to uh, protection of yeah, environmental issues that endanger life particularly and that's an important development. Any questions on human rights? Yep. Yeah, so gr look, again, a great question. Like, what happens in courts with these sorts of arguments? Basically, no one disputes the science anymore. Like, even the mining companies uh, don't dispute that climate change is real and it's happening. So, in the last, like, 10 years ago, I had a judge who even the mining company accepted climate change was real and was happening. And then the judge went out and did a Google search and came back and gave us a decision saying climate change basically denial points and then we appealed that and won on appeal um, but since then I've never had any even mining companies don't dispute the science because it's just they get clobbered in court on that but what happens in court is often courts and decision makers will avoid liability by saying okay well climate change is real and is happening but the classic argument that we've used in multiple court cases in Queensland is I call it the drug dealers defense and it's if we don't sell the coal someone else will Therefore, there is no impact from us selling coal because if we didn't sell it, it would just come from Indonesia or China would produce its own. There would be no change in global warming. So therefore, approving this massive mine has no impact on climate change. So it's effectively a wipe your hands of responsibility and it's a mental trick to avoid the implications because you know, in those sorts of court cases, there's uncontested evidence that the Great Barrier Reef is stuffed, that it's going to be gone no one wants to accept that we are responsible for that. So everyone wants to avoid it, so we play mental tricks uh, to avoid liability for it. So we accept the science, and then we say, but if we didn't do it, someone else would, therefore there's no change, therefore we're not causing global warming. We can have this, it's sort of like you can have your cake and eat it too. We can have our coal, and we're not responsible for the impacts that it causes. Does that make sense? It doesn't make, really make sense to me, but that's what happens. It's probably a different question is that, clear. Not that it makes sense. Okay, can we move on just briefly for like really brief time tautology, to the Antarctic Treaty and I just wanted to mention this treaty for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, notice we've jumped from 1948, we jumped to 1959. So over 10 years, no big treaties in that time and in fact after this treaty we're also going to jump forward um, to like the 1970s um, because there wasn't a lot happening in terms of environmental the environment protection at an international level through this whole period. The Antarctic Treaty 1959 though has become important uh, is important and the Antarctic Treaty system that's developed around it um, so this, it's the same context as we've dealt with before post World War II rebuilding um, concern for the environment low deals with Antarctica that we talked about in relation to whaling. So there's a number of claims over Antarctica that aren't broadly accepted. And they aren't broadly accepted because of the politics. Uh, this is one of Australia's permanent bases, uh, Casey. Now, the Antarctic Treaty, I'm not going to open up the whole treaty, it's quite short. But Article 1 says, Antarctica shall be used for peaceful purposes only. They shall be prohibited 
inter alia, which is Latin for, amongst other things, any measures of a military nature, such as the establishment of military bases and fortifications, the carrying out of military manoeuvres, as well as the testing of any types of weapons. And Article 5, any nuclear explosions in Antarctica and the disposal of their radioactive waste material shall be prohibited. Now, I mentioned this back in the first lecture. If you look at that from our perspective in 2019, it just sounds nuts. Like, who would even think about you know, blowing up a nuclear weapon in, in Antarctica and disposing of radioactive waste there. It just sounds nuts. But back in 1959, it's the height of the Cold War. Article 1 and Article 5 were actually massive, massive achievements for the global community because it was a real concern that Antarctica could become another theatre or another potential flashpoint for World War III and also that the USSR and the USA would start testing nuclear weapons there. So this was a massive achievement in effectively, at the height of the Cold War, the USSR and the USA agreeing, you know, that part of the world, we're just going to leave it off limits. We both agree that it's off limits for military bases. That was a big achievement, but it really only makes sense in the politics and history of the time. Okay, Article 4. So, you know, I said that um, normally you interpret a treaty according to its plain meaning and in good faith. I just want to talk about Article 4 briefly because this is an article that's been written deliberately to be confusing. Article 4, because the parties couldn't agree about sovereignty, they had to come up with a mechanism. So Australia says, we've got sovereignty, and the US doesn't recognise that sovereignty. Uh, and the USSR doesn't recognise Australia's sovereignty. So how do they come up with an agreement that deals with that sovereignty issue? Well, basically, they sort of papered over the disagreement with Article 4. Nothing in, contained in the present... And, and uh, this is going to be confusing, but it's meant to be confusing. Nothing contained in the present treaty shall be interpreted as a renunciation by any contracting party of a previously asserted claim of or claims to territorial sovereignty in Antarctica. So that's from Australia's perspective. By signing this, we don't renounce any of our previous claims. B, a renunciation um, or diminution by any contracting party of any basis of a claim to territorial sovereignty in Antarctica. So that's like the US, which might want to claim sovereignty in the future. It sort of wants to keep its options open. It says we won't recognise sovereignty by other countries, but we might claim it in the future if we feel like it. So B is like the US and China and USSR's position. And then C, prejudicing the position of any contracting party to the recognition or non-recognition of any right or claim or to sovereignty. So basically, what does that say? Not a lot. Nothing, you know, you can't rely upon anything in this treaty for really anything about sovereignty. And then two, no acts or activities taking place while the present treaty is in force shall constitute a basis for asserting, supporting or denying a claim to sovereignty in Antarctica, etc. So I just jumped to a quote from Professor Julian Triggs, a really uh, a great Australian international lawyer. She wrote a book um, back in 1986 where she looked at Australia's claim to sovereignty in Antarctica and she wrote about Article 4 and I just love it. She's just so insightful. The purpose of Article 4 was to preserve the apparently irreconcilable interests of claimants, potential claimants and non-claimants. As a result, this ambiguous article states what it doesn't mean and doesn't state what it does mean. It is deliberately obscure, leaving each state free to interpret the article consistently with its particular interests. While Article 4 creates a purgatory of ambiguity, more positively it enabled the parties to move forward to establish the treaty regime. So, that sounds confusing, but basically it's meant to be confusing because they couldn't agree, but they basically left the sovereignty issues and moved forward to agree, okay, well, we can't agree on sovereignty, but what we agree on is we're not going to have any military bases in Antarctica. We're not going to use it for nuclear weapons testing or nuclear disposal. So can you see how by leaving that problem of sovereignty to one side, you can actually achieve important things so Article 4 is actually really important, but deliberately confusing and ambiguous. 
Can you just imagine the lawyer and me thinking of, you know, deliberately writing something so that it's so no one can understand it and actually intending that to the outcome? <laughs> it's pretty weird. Okay, Article 10. Um, yeah, there's basically, it, it's the article, this treaty is fairly brief, but it allows um, contracting parties to meet uh, and basically agree on other measures. And then under that system, they meet. So here's delegates to the Antarctic Treaty meeting in 2006. Can I emphasize in this sort of picture, I know, I know all of these people are, look older than you guys, and some of them have got you know, a, a tie on like me, but you know, these are just ordinary people. This isn't Barack Obama or, or you know, um, Vladimir Putin sitting down, you know, the sort of high level meters, sorry, high level leaders at an international level. These are ordinary people doing normal treaty work at an international meeting. People like you and me, or you guys maybe in a few years time when you're say working for government, you guys could be in that sort of, those sorts of meetings in years to come. It's ordinary people do the bread and butter work in these international meetings, not just the international leaders. Okay, so um, the Antarctic um, Treaty has led on to what's called the Antarctic Treaty System. So the Antarctic Treaty 1959, then there's a series of other con conventions, the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Seals, 1972, Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, CAMLA, and then the Protocol on Environment Protection to the Antarctic Treaty, the Madrid Protocol, which prohibits mining for 50 years within Antarctica. So that Antarctic Treaty system essentially has established Antarctica as pretty well like an international, not park, but you know, there's a whole range of bases that are down there that are mainly used for science and research. Sure, countries are staking or maintaining their claims to develop Antarctica in the future. That's clearly why many countries are there, is to maintain their ability to exploit Antarctica in the future. But um, at the moment, it's because it's so remote and inhosp inhospitable, a lot of its resources are, can't be economically developed. Um, I won't worry about that. We'll deal with those sorts of questions when we get to um, revising the... Um, for the exam, but like this is a previous exam question which basically gives you a quote of Article 1 and then gives you a little set of facts about the US aircraft going down, is there a breach of the Antarctic Treaty, and essentially it's just asking you to apply the normal principles of treaty interpretation, and basically Article 1 says it shouldn't be used for military bases or fortifications, but Paragraph 2 says the pre present treaty shall not, be, not prevent the use of military personnel or equipment, for scientific research or for other peaceful purposes. The facts tell you that a US Air Force plane goes down to resupply the scientific base McMurdo in Antarctica. And is that a breach? And the simple answer is no, because the treaty tells you you can use military personnel as long as they're there for to assist scientific research. So it's a simple treaty interpretation problem where I give you a bit of the treaty. So I don't expect you to remember like Article 1 or anything like that, if I'm gonna ask you something like that on the exam, it'll be really obvious, and it's more about you just showing me that you can do basic things with treaty interpretation. Does that sound okay? Okay, so take home points. Uh, international trade law, wrapping up this lecture on trade, human rights, and Antarctic Treaty. International trade has enormous impacts on the environment, and it's very difficult to regulate. Restrictions on trade can be imposed on environmental grounds so long as they're not arbitrary or discriminatory. Measures to implement cooperative international efforts such as CITES are more likely to satisfy those requirements than unilateral non-consensual measures. So if you've got a broad agreement about dealing with an issue, that's highly likely to survive a sort of challenge based on trade grounds. Whereas if you do something by yourself, um, that's when you can often run into difficulties. So uh, there's no express right to a healthy environment under international human rights, but recent climate litigation has established the right to life includes a right to an environment that does not endanger life. And the historical and political context can be crucial for understanding a treaty, and the example there is the Antarctic Treaty. And treaties are sometimes written to be deliberately obscure. Article 4 of the Antarctic Treaty is an example there. But generally, if you apply those simple rules that I gave you, if you read a treaty and it says 
x, then x is what it means. It's, you just have to be able to read it and have the confidence to go and find it, look at it, and read it. And you can work out what the main obligations are under it. OK, so that's wrapping up GATT, Human Rights, and the Antarctic Treaty.